Hello and welcome back to Lean on Success, where process improvement is self-improvement. My name is Ben. I'm a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt. And today I have asked Scott Barber to be back on the show with us again. How are you doing, Scott? Doing well, Ben. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate the time. Why don't you take a second and remind everybody what you do for a living? Uh, Scott Barber, CPA here in uh, West Virginia. Um, work for the Department of Treasury. Uh, so this is uh, happens to be sort of an area that is a hot button for me professionally where I'm at, uh, an accountant here with the Treasury Department out of West Virginia. Awesome. Yeah, I, I wanted you to come on the show because there have been some interesting things happening in the government as it relates to federal debt. And I wanted to have you provide some insight to me as well as our viewers in terms of what does all this mean? Sure. So uh, I'll start with uh, Janet Yellen sent a letter on May 15th to certain congressional leaders basically urging Congress to increase the debt ceiling in order to avoid some uh, catastrophes that she alluded to. So my first question to you would be, what is the debt ceiling? Well, and I appreciate that question. First, let me lead off by saying that everything I say here is public knowledge. I'm not saying anything that's, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, sensitive, classified, right. uh, you know, uh, anything confidential. This is all anything that anyone could Google. So let me just get that right off the, uh, right okay. off the top. This is any inside information, but uh, when talking about the debt ceiling, let's talk about what it's not. Cause I've had a lot of people ask me about what's going to happen if the debt ceiling is reached. And it seems like a lot of people I speak with personally about the debt ceiling issues seem to conflate the budget with the debt ceiling. Now it's not the budget. The budget is set spending that the federal government has committed to through its annual budget. They have what's called an omnibus bill that's passed every year by Congress, the House and the Senate signed by the president becomes law. And that allocates funds to all of the agencies uh, in the federal government. And it commits all of the spending for the year for the federal government. So it sets the budget for the federal government in that bill. And that's different than the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling is what it sounds like. It's how much the the, the maximum amount that the federal government can borrow to account for, for the spending bill. So every year, our budget for the past few years, I think it's been since the 90s that we haven't had a balanced budget. You hear a lot about a balanced budget. And all that means is, are your revenues, are your taxes uh, that are coming into the federal government, are they equaling the amount that we're spending out? Mm -hmm. And for several years, it hasn't. The tax revenue has been lower than the spending. And because of that, you have to find cash somehow. So what they do is the federal government borrows to make up for that cash deficit. And that's the reason that the uh, debt uh, keeps raising year after year is because we have the shortfall in what our revenues are. So all of that being said, sort of level set on what uh, spending versus the debt ceiling is. The debt ceiling is simply... How much can we borrow in a numeric amount? Think of it like your credit card has a max limit. Okay. Is the easiest way to think about it. And gotcha. you think about your budget is your how much you have to spend to fund the household. You have outflows of six thousand dollars a month when your uh, income is only four thousand a month, then you've got two thousand a month you got to make up there. So you put that on your credit card to make up for the difference because you still got bills to pay come in every month right well eventually you're going to reach at max for the credit card what you're going to do is you're going to call a credit card company and say hey can you raise can you raise my limit and if you're in good standing and you've kept paying your bills likely they'll uh, want to retain you as customer and they'll raise your limit up to a point and then when that point is they cut you off and that's essentially where we're at right now is it has to literally go through congress to raise the debt ceiling that's uh, held through the House of Representatives uh, to start with, so to speak. And if they elect not to, it doesn't get raised. And if it doesn't get raised, then we fit the debts. What would happen if Congress says, you know what, we're not going to increase the, the credit limit anymore. We're going to cut you off. What happens? 
And that's the, well, the debt's around $31.5 trillion right now. And that's the $31.5 trillion question is what <laughs> will happen. And I, I, I mean, it's funny, you bring me on here to be like, hey, what's going to happen when you hit debt ceiling? And the, the short answer is, we don't know, is because in the history of the United States, they've, they've always managed to pay their debts. They've never defaulted on anything ever. Mm -hmm. So this will be literally uncharted territory for the United States if the debt ceiling is uh, is is reached. There's been a lot of economic theory and there's been a lot of experts weigh in as to what is going to happen. Um, there's belief that uh, consumer confidence will be affected by this because people are talking about this. You and I are talking about this. Right. And uh, be, this is. The most I've heard the general public, so to speak, have an ear to the ground when it comes to the debt ceiling, because we've reached the debt ceiling almost 80 times since 1960. Okay. And most times with the debt ceiling, it's raised almost, sometimes it's been raised unanimously through Congress. They voted unanimously to raise the debt ceiling because it's never really been a partisan issue uh, in previous years. But as of late, it's become a partisan issue between the parties being considered a bargaining chip by the Republicans who now hold the House to do something about we're at a budget deficit year after year. So, gotcha. but we've never, we've never actually hit the ceiling ever, 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 ever. And we've never defaulted on anything. So it's hard to tell. There's uh, theories that consumer confidence will take a hit and it will lead us into a recession. There's talk that there will be immediate job losses in the millions that uh, unemployment, we're, we're seeing a natural unemployment now, which is around 4%, which is about where you want unemployment to be at a natural rate. And there's talk that that will double almost instantly. Uh, there, Goldman Sachs has even said that 10% of U.S. economic activity instantly halt. And ironically, the, the one thing that, it, that will happen is the national debt will likely rise because <laughs> because we've hit the debt ceiling and mm -hmm. because the the debt's still there and the interest keeps compounding on it and even though you're not borrowing actively or not uh, and not spending the the number still increases because of that interest uh, gotcha so okay. so <laughs> the ironic piece of it is is it's not going to do anything to help um offset between revenues and expenditures immediately but it'll cause a lot of damage and how long it lasts will be the real telling thing about how much damage it's going to do but it gotcha. it's i've heard things from mildly catastrophic to complete chaos and okay. with as many people talking about it i tend to think that consumer confidence will be at a low people will panic and it will be as bad or worse than what we're thinking that it's going to be, but we okay. don't know what it's going to be. It's going, but it's nothing's going to be good. Everyone agrees. Right. It's nothing good. You talked about the credit card analogy. I think that's an excellent analogy. When I borrow money on my American express card, I know who it's owed to. I send a check to American express. <laughs> right. When right. the government borrows money, who or what are they borrowing it from? And who is this debt owed to? There's around 31, I think it's around 31 and a half trillion. The majority of it, about 24 and a half of that is public debt. Those are foreign government bonds. Those are U.S. bonds and investors. Uh, those are state governments. But the biggest one is actually the Federal Reserve. And you're thinking, well, Federal Reserve doesn't sound like it's public. That sounds like it's part of the government. And the Federal Reserve in the Central Bank of the United States kind of operates as both public and private. It's funny. I even researching for this, I was like, how do I explain how the Federal Reserve works as far as being a public borrower, but still being the central bank of the U.S. government? And I go to the website and there's a FAQ from the, from the Fed website it says, uh, is the Federal Reserve a government entity? And the literal answer it has on the website is yes and no, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is just hilarious because it's perfect. And it was established by U.S. Congress in the early 20th century. Uh, so it's Congress established, but at the same time, uh, the 12 banks are run relatively independently from the government. So it doesn't have pressures 
it stays away from the government pressure to act in certain ways that are outside of what they would consider what is best for the U.S. economy. I say all that to say that they held about 35% of that $24.5 trillion in, um, in debt. The rest of it is intra-government. It's around $7 trillion. The majority of that is being held by Social Security trusts. Social Security trust funds account for almost $3 trillion of that. It's, it's incomes are less than its outlays right now. So uh, because of that, it's able to invest in the federal government. So it's using that extra funds, not just stuffing it under a mattress. It's actually investing it. It's investing it through treasury bonds and other forms of securities through the federal government. So the majority of it is public. A little piece of it is intergovernmental though. Based on what you said, correct me if if I'm if this is way off, but it sounds like the government owes the money to itself <laughs> a little bit right that's exactly right it it kind of owes it to itself yeah that, that's not confusing which, at all <laughs> which is i'm telling you the further you go down it it does get confusing but uh that's kind of how that's kind of how it works but a lot of it is uh external it's enough of it to be external like i think japan has about a trillion of uh the debt right now uh, japan's the leading uh, debt holder as far as foreign entities go, and then China right behind it at about $800 billion. The last thing I want to ask you is, we know that the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates pretty consistently to fight inflation. I've, been, I've done mm -hmm. multiple videos about this, including the one that I just released a few days ago by the time this releases. And mm -hmm. how does that impact the debt ceiling and the government's ability to kind of keep up with the debt? Well, it's it's the directly related in that while I was talking about the Federal Reserve, that's um, who's holding a lot of those bonds. What they're doing is they're actually releasing those bonds and they're actually holding less of those and then raising the interest rate on what they have because they have less funds on hand. So they have to raise the interest rate on that. But it also eases the uh, available cash for the federal government uh, to have available. So it's easing inflation, but at the same time, raising interest rates and tightening up the economy, so to speak. Initially, it like in 2020 with quantitative easing with uh, the funds that were sent out by the government in uh, forms of stimulus checks, what they were trying to do is try to get the uh, money out there in the populace to be spent. Last yeah. video we did together, I was talking about the Keynesian wheel about how more spending begets more spending. And now, mm -hmm. now that we're getting to a point where it's getting a little out of control and the wheel's going a little too fast, that's when they're tightening up raising the interest rate and making borrowing less appealing mm -hmm. by the general public and getting less cash out there so that it tightens up and constricts and slows that down a little bit so that the prices of everything comes down. If that, again, right. uh, economics uh, gets gets a little crazy. That's about as simple as I can put it uh, quickly. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean by that. Uh, the last video I did, I was attempting to explain the Federal Reserve's actions around quantitative easing and tightening by using the uh, MV equals PQ equation. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Classic. I did the best that I could in trying to break it down simply, but there's just so many moving there's... parts associated with <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, when you get into economics, there are so many variables, there's so many assumptions, there's so many, there's so many things that you have to account for that it could go in so many directions. It's hard to nutshell describe what's going on with it but yeah. again when you talk about quantitative easing that's uh, in general is is more money out in the public more money gets spent the better the economy works is the thirty thousand foot view of it it's a little frustrating for me because i'm good at explaining things i'm good at math and i do statistics for a living and i'm struggling understanding it's, it. <laughs> it's hard it really it's a hard concept i mean again it's it's difficult because there's so many if then it's almost like it's just a never-ending chain of if then uh, equations that gotcha. they go on forever and it it makes it hard to explain it quickly and easily all right so just want to summarize what we talked through so we talked about sure. the debt ceiling is essentially a credit card limit that the government has and imposes on itself the yeah. majority of the that credit card balance the government owes to itself. Well, I wouldn't even say the majority now. The easy way to say it is seven trillion is truly intergovernmental of the thirty-one. Gotcha. So about thirty percent of it is, 
Right. But uh, it's the same, and that's a, a good amount. But at the same right. time, a lot of it is to other external entities like state governments, local governments, and foreign right. governments is the big one. But to a lot of other governments, yes, <laughs> it's it's the governments it. owing okay. governments, including their own government. So a lot of that is owed to who already owns the treasury bonds, which are a variety of yeah. individuals and entities. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So that's, yep. that's a big chunk of what the debt is owed to people who have purchased treasury bonds. Okay. Yep. That, that makes sense. If the debt ceiling isn't raised, there's a lot of speculation about how bad things will get. Everyone agrees that things will get worse, but we don't really know exactly what will happen or how bad it's going to be. Right. It's, it's, again, it's truly uncharted territory. Yeah. The government's never defaulted before. We've lived through shutdowns of the government mm -hmm. uh, due to uh, them not being able to come together on a spending bill, uh, which is okay. typically what happens. The government shuts down. But okay. this is bigger than the government shutting down. Now, this is the economy uh, being potentially shutting down. So okay. it's much bigger uh, stakes than previously, say, with government shutdowns due to bill differences uh, in Congress. This is this is a different entity altogether. And it's it's we think we know we know it's going to be bad, but we don't know to what extent because we don't know how long and we don't know the reaction by both the U.S. public and the world uh, in general. The short path to make money on places like YouTube is to preach a bunch of hyperbole, gloom and doom, incite panic, right. and so forth. And I made an ethical decision when I started this channel that I wasn't going to do that. I wanted to get to the bottom of things and be truthful and, and show and be transparent about what's happening. But I never wanted my motivation to, to cause people to panic. But yeah. is there something that consumers can do to either protect themselves from the bad stuff that might happen, or is there an opportunity for someone to take advantage of what's happening and, and actually benefit their lives? As far as the opportunities, I, I don't really know of how one could, could take this as an opportunity because we don't know uh, what the markets are going to do, if it's going to affect the market at large, assuming it is. But even then, uh, by doing so, almost causes what could happen to happen. It's almost sort of like with the banks. The run on mm -hmm. the banks is because people panicked and ran on the banks. Mm -hmm. And same thing here is if people pull uh, money out of the market in, and try to find it in more uh, quote-unquote uh, conservative places – that will cause the market to slide. If I tell people to take your money out and put it in something conservative, then what happens is, is that causes the thing that we're trying to prevent. And yeah, mm, people yeah. will benefit from it, but <laughs> at large, it'll ruin a lot of uh, lives and the economy as a whole. Conversely, what I'm thinking with that is, is uh, like I said before, don't panic. Mm -hmm. Is uh, I know I'm not going to panic with it. I'm not going to, me personally, I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do anything but stay the course with investments, spending, everything. I don't plan on changing a lot. Now, I'll react to the world change around me, but I, I don't plan on changing a lot. And that may be mm -hmm. a little Pollyanna on my end. But again, I've had faith in the economy from the very beginning. I'll continue to have faith in the economy. I think that whatever happens with this, we will come out of the other end. It may take a while. I don't know how long, but we'll continue to uh, prosper and rise as a national economy. And I say all of that, again, to say not only don't panic, but the faith in the economy is what causes the economy to go. And mm -hmm. to continue to have faith in it is the only thing to do. The thing that is going to affect most people personally is simply things that are largely out of their control, which is job loss. You know, if uh, we're mm -hmm. talking about this raising unemployment, not a lot that people can do uh, about that if jobs get cut. Now, I say all of this to say the best part, though, is that I truly, deep in my heart, do not believe we are going to reach the debt ceiling. I think it's going to be raised. I do not. I'll. Mm -hmm. uh, we may look on this video in a few weeks and say, oh boy, Scott really missed that one as I'm living <laughs> out of my cardboard box. 
<laughs> you know, but I don't think anyone wants this to happen, truly wants mm, this right. to happen. Reaching the debt ceiling really doesn't solve the spending problem. Again, we've committed to spending in the bill. Right. So by reaching the debt ceiling, that's just when you've maxed out your credit card, just basically saying in your house, you're like, well, I'm just going to default on everything and, you know, be done with it. Well, that doesn't make the problem go away. And it right. certainly doesn't fix the problem. The debt mm -hmm. is still there. The bills are still owed. Right. You're just doubling the problem by not keeping the wheel in motion. I think yeah. everyone who is involved in this decision is educated, is at the heart of it. I mean, there's a lot of grand thing, a lot of politicizing with it, but at the heart of it, I think they realize that by reaching the debt ceiling, there's truly no benefit by doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, I, I, I really do think it'll be, it may be an 11th hour thing, but I think it will be, uh, it will, this, this isn't going to happen. I cannot um, wait for our follow up again when I'm yeah. uh, uh, outside and using solar power to power the laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, thank you so much uh, for yeah, coming no on. Thank uh, you. We'll definitely do a follow up episode. I, I want to follow up with you uh, next month. There's mm -hmm. an unemployment report that's going to be released in early June. And then we got the CPI report and the Fed reserve meeting happening mid June. So we'd love to have you on the show after all those things occur, kind of kind of debrief and talk through sure. what's happening. And if we had the debt ceiling before then, maybe none of those other things will matter. Maybe none we'll of that matter. Or or we'll have a whole lot to talk we'll about. We'll have a whole lot to talk about. So we'll be and talking about a lot of June, time no to talk what. about it too. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, for sure. Not doing anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Scott. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate you. All right. Thank y'all. Until next time. Thanks.